And that's what I think everybody needs to understand about Martin King. He was created out of black institutions, beginning with the black family. Mm, mm, mm. Created out of black institutions, connected by black institutions, all of that. Yes. Yes. I love that. I love that. That's And that's big, Dr. Carr. And the reason why that's so big and that's so important, because again, if you reflect now, right, we're looking at, at 2024, you have to ask yourself, where and what are the black institutions? Mm. Because so much of what you were talking about and so much of what you're saying, Dr. King was heavily connected to the black church. Um, and the black church was, it was a sacred space. Absolutely. That's how you were able to plot and plan and co-conspire, right? Because it was a sacred space. Like, right. of course you went to worship every Sunday, but you knew that the neighborhood was going to be there. The pastor could give a message in the pulpit. Uh, you could have Sunday school, give a message at Sunday school. You could organize, you can speak. It was a sacred place. Um, same thing when you talk about the black family uh, being a black institution, right? So hmm. being grounded in certain morals, certain values of certain conversations you have with your kids in your household, uh, certain, certain ways of being, doing and knowing all of that. Uh, Martin Luther King was connected to, hmm. but then you have to ask yourself, right? At this point, right, because back then it was um, segregation, there was still a certain level of whiteness that has not that had not infiltrated even the black household. Oh, Lord. Um, so even though you have institution, right, and you still have black family now, but how much of that space has been infiltrated um, by whiteness or infiltrated by things outside of your home that you can't necessarily control that your children are exposed to or influenced by? Uh, to a certain degree, right? But during segregation, you didn't have that. No. So as you talk about the life um, of Martin Luther King and what made him the man that he is, I can't help but think, what are the Black institutions of today? Um, what are influencing our Black people and our Black leaders of today? This is one of them. It looks very different. Martin King didn't have a, a Black educator pipeline uh, he didn't have a, a, a podcast. He didn't have the internet. He didn't have. Imagine you imagine he had a podcast called Let Freedom Ring. Sorry, Let I didn't. Say... <laughs> but the, the, look, you look seriously. Th this is the value of this space because whether we want to or not, that is the imagination we have to cultivate with our young people. Welcome, 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 welcome. You are listening to Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast, the place where we talk to real people in the real struggle, doing the real work. I'm your host, Shana Terrell, educator activist dedicated to the lifelong struggle of freedom and liberation for my people. Welcome back to all my co-conspirators. So let me just address my short, but probably felt kind of long hiatus. As you all know, um, I was pregnant and yes, I have dropped that present. I have dropped my little one, my six month old, about to be six month old baby boy Adonis. So I have been spending the last five and a half months out here just mothering, mothering, mothering. So shout out to all the mothers out there. Um, uh, you just never know what that experience is like until you're experiencing it. Um, and that zero to three stage is, is something more. <laughs> it's something more. So I had, to, I had to come out of that on top. All right. Um, but that, that's where I've been. I've been out here mothering y'all. Um, so I'm excited to be back. Excited to have my listeners back. I know a couple of you have reached out to me wondering what was going on, if the show was coming back. Well, we are back, baby, and happy 2024. But what better way to bring the show back than our resident guest, y'all, with Baba Dr. Greg Carr, associate professor at Howard University, host of In Class with Carr and The Black Table. OK, he is here today to talk about so many things for us with us. One of the things is what are we leaving in 2023? What are we looking forward to in 2024? Uh, we're going to definitely talk about MLK. Uh, we're also going to talk about. Mama Shariki Joanza. Um, Dr. Carr is going to tell us all about her life and celebration. Um, and she has moved on with the ancestors. But Gosh. so many other topics to talk about because we've been gone for so long. But Gosh. Dr. Carr, welcome, brother. Hey, Mama Shana, how are you? 
I'm we were okay. joking before uh, about Cat Williams uh, saying all the comedians who ripped him off. So we're not going to say that <laughs> Shannon Sharp ripped you off because this is the original Club Shay Shay. It so is. we just want to say, to say that this is the original. original. All others are imitators, it's but imitators. Uh, okay. it's not in substance because this. <laughs> and of course, Baby Adonis, who we all got to see as he became the youngest attendee at the Black Male Educator Conference. He Loved on by thousands. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, that young brother said, wait a minute, I'm he hit the ground working. The youngest black male educator at the <laughs> <laughs> He following in his daddy's footsteps. And we gotta teach him young. We gotta Gosh, teach him young. Teach him young. My man is daddy's footsteps. Yes. It's good to see you, sis, and it's good to, to hear you hailing hardy and strong and busting up in twenty twenty four even better than in twenty twenty. Yes, I'm excited. I'm rejuvenated. I got a different set of set of goals and mindset because you know just being a mother is different. It changes your entire perspective. We will do an episode on that one day. One day, mothers, gotcha. mother educators. Yes. <laughs> so, You've had a lot of them that. come through here. So, I mean, you've already yes. convened. And on behalf of my mama, who was an ancestor, and my auntie, and all of them who raised us, you know, yes. I can only say that watching you with Adonis is a reminder of where that strength of Black men and Black women come from. It's from oh. our fathers, but it's first from our mothers. The first oh, teacher, so so it's thanks. a blessing. Doc, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Now we have not convened in this space specifically. We've been convened in other spaces, but we have not convened in this space specifically since Freedom Summer, uh, twenty twenty three. Wow! Like it just has been some time, Doc. So what have you been up to since Freedom Summer? Well, you know, continuing to work. It's like you, I mean, it's not like you uh, retreated from the battlefield. We came, mm-hmm. we came through the baby shower, you still working. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> we, up there, we out there in the park, like, Shannon's still working. What is going on? That was, the, of course, the weekend of Odun Day. In it was the so, weekend of Odun Day, and the baby shower was at the Belmont Mansion, which historically was a piece of the Underground Railroad. Absolutely. So, so I mean, yes. we, we continue to work. I mean, it's so funny. Our Freedom Summer there, where, of course, we got a chance to spend time with Baba Mike, Mama Zahara, the deep mm-hmm. Philadelphia story, and did our book, Stayed on Freedom. You know, and we overlapped, actually, um, with the transition of Christine King Ferris, Dr. King's sister, his oldest sister, who made transition during the time that we were in Freedom Summer. And mm-hmm. um, since then, you know, the world has continued to spin. Uh, mm-hmm. So many lives have been lost. We mourn the lives in Congo and Sudan and Haiti, and of course in Occupy Palestine. And mm-hmm. the world continues to, uh, you know, there was the big climate summit, the COPES summit, where we addressed the existential threat of global warming, or try to anyway, in the island nations where so many of our people are living, and so many non white folk and poor people in the world uh, came mm-hmm. to the table with a plea said the, the water is rising. We're not going to have a place literally to stand if this doesn't stop. And and so there's been a lot that has happened since we were all together uh, last. And, and, and we see the forces and the things that threaten us. And we see the beautiful struggle and the resistance. And of course, that's at the heart of mm-hmm. this work. And so we continue to we tend to resist and continue to build a better world. Yes. And I mean, hearing you speak, this is like it's always something, right? Mm-hmm. The struggle always continues. The fight is never over. (laughs) You can never take a break. Um, Mm -hmm. Even at times when you retreat from the world for different things, the world will still spin. It will still go on. Things will still continue. So we still got stuff happening. Um, And speaking of that, right? So we are now entering 2024. Happy, Mm -hmm. happy new year, Doc. Happy New Year. Happy European Question. calendar, messed up calendar New Year. But yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> In fact, uh, we're on the verge, I think, uh, the second, the beginning of the second week of uh, January, I think it's the mm-hmm. 6th or the 7th, is Christmas. In Ethiopia, so mm. the Ethiopian Christmas is in January, and of course their New Year is in September, like the Egyptian New Year was. So, but but we use this date, and of mm-hmm. course with Kwanzaa being the last day, being faith, January the first, the brilliance of the creators of Kwanzaa, and of course Malana Karinga is given credit for with shaping it. All the people in us, and of course our sister uh, there in uh, Philadelphia, of Mama course Maisha um, uh, Mama Maisha. And, yes. uh, you know, being a central part of that. In fact, you sent us all a photograph. What was that photograph you sent us 
of uh, Maisha standing in front of what looked like to be a large Kanara, a, a Kwanzaa. A, but yes. what in the world was that? It seemed like it was some history being made out there with some freedom school ties. It was, <laughs> it was freedom school ties and it was major history. Um, here in Philadelphia is the first time a Kanara was displayed outside of City Hall. My goodness. Um, and the picture that I sent you was a picture of the Kanara and our dear brother, uh, Councilman, Mr. Whip, um, Isaiah Thomas. Come on now. Um, making a speech in front of the Kanara. Um, Come on, Frankfurt High School, first but... class of Philadelphia Freedom School students, 1999. This man's a, man a councilman and the whip. <laughs> what yes. in the world? What in the world? Pol people say, don't get involved in politics. Oh, be quiet. You got to watch this. This man fights for us. Yes. What a beautiful thing. <laughs> all, all the changes we can make, right? All the, all the changes the... we can make. And we lift brother uh, Isaiah and it was her, his father, right? Who would... Uh, his mom, his, mom. his mom, his mom, his mom joined the ancestors. Mom joined the ancestors. Yes. Yeah. She passed. In 2023. Mm -hmm. She did. So we, yeah, we lift, we lift him because many of us know what that means. And of course she fights for us now on the other side, but that good brother, uh, it, it works tirelessly for us. And it's important to, you know, because a lot of people will say, well, why get involved in electoral politics? You know, no, no, no. We don't have the option of sitting things out. We don't have the option of picking our perfect heroes and sheroes. What we have the option of doing is fighting. As Paul Robeson said, there is no sheltered rear. Well, and, you think uh, of it like this, right? The seed planted many years ago, as you said, back from 99 in Brother Isaiah and what that rooted into with him understanding how to use his voice, getting into politics, but also being shaped in the right mindset, in the cultural mind to say like, hey, right. we celebrate Hanukkah, we celebrate Christmas, all these other stuff. So why not have a, in a black city, why not celebrate Kwanzaa and celebrate it publicly celebrate um, publicly and so, put those values in practice in public policy so while there's some people say well the canara that's nice but what are we doing for the people hold oh, slow down the principles of kwanzaa are at work in the politics of an isaiah Thomas. as you say i mean he didn't just come through freedom schools in one year he stayed he worked on sites he ran sites then of course helped fight to get sankofa freedom academy worked there m hotel working through that space and then, you know, so when you see him, you see unity, you see moja, you see definitely uh, cooperative economics, collective work and responsibility. You see his creativity, you see his purpose and you see his faith. All of those principles, those are year round principles. And so, you know, th those those symbols that we look at from December 26th to January 1st are important because they remind us of the principles that should guide us every day day and so and this I mean, is just, why education and exposure are so important because that brother had yes. those things and what he was exposed to and what he was taught that's um right. he brings that with him now yeah. into his into the political field so that's super right. important instead of looking at some of these clowns uh we can tell how what they were exposed to <laughs> <laughs> or what they chose not to listen to because right? this uh, <laughs> the struggle continues yeah and, and what they were taught right Mm -hmm. That the Civil War was about everything but what? <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. Sh sh shout out to our sister Nimrata, who doesn't seem to have remembered her uh, her roots. You know, her father was a professor. Of course, we're talking about the woman who now chooses to call herself Nikki Haley, mm -hmm. uh, whose mother and father, of course, came from India. And her father taught for almost 30 years at Voorhees, an HBCU in South Carolina. Now, she didn't go to the public schools there in the suburbs of Columbia, South Carolina. She went to a private school that was 90-some percent white, and the school system there is 90-some percent black. And so when they asked her at this town hall a few weeks ago uh, what the Civil War was about, uh, she said a bunch of other uh, um, um, states' rights and whether the federal government can interfere. And then the, the questioner was like, well, what about slavery? She said, oh. What, what do you want me to say about slavery? In other words, yeah. It would, and so, of course, she quickly retracted that. But you understand, Nikki Haley has built a career on mm -hmm. being craven politically. She mm -hmm. kissed Trump's behind until it wasn't convenient. Mm -hmm. And then she turned on him uh, when she's running for office. When the when Bree Newsom took this, the flag, the Confederate battle flag off of the uh, flagpole in front of the South Carolina state legislature, there at the state capitol, following in the tradition of a brother whose name he called himself Reverend E.X. Slave, who for many years tried to set fire to that flag. Well, mm -hmm. the legislature met and uh, there was a petition that was started by my friend and our sister, Karen Hunter, that gathered three quarters of a million signatures. And they worked on those legislators and in a historic 
all night debate in the in the South Carolina legislature, uh, they voted to take that flag down permanently. And of course, Nikki Haley signed that legislation, but not because she wanted to. She had come out defending that flag as being for heritage. But after the the winds moved in another direction, she signed the legislature, signed the bill. She's going around the the world talking about how she was the one that that got the legislation that took the flag down. She's a craven politician. And on the slavery question, she showed her true colors. And her true colors, of course, are whatever color you are. Nikki Mm. Haley is a commute. And uh, hopefully she won't end up being the president of the United States. But uh, we'll see. Oh, she won't end up being the president of the United uh, States. Anything could happen. I mean, you could have somebody who uh, if mounted an insurrection, depending on what the Supreme Court says, he might end up being the president of the United States. And then we're going to have to count on your skills to re- the reincarnation of Harriet Tubman to, be <laughs> to uh, get Adonis and everybody and the rest of us into Canada or uh, Mexico or make uh, somewhere to take us away. <laughs> not have me lead the great escape, honey. Oh, okay. it's not rhetorical. It's not rhetorical, my <laughs> Harriet. You got to show us the way. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, or at least get to New York because uh, whatever problems are in New York, I know that Trump ain't crazy enough to come in New York City. Uh, Letitia James got some forms up there, so listen, <laughs> I'm gonna be showing up. I'm gonna be showing the other side of Harry Tugman. I'm gonna be a little yeah. Harry Tugman with a with a little piece of Nat Turner, honey. I ain't going nowhere. All right, so we oh, ain't, ooh, <laughs> ooh, ooh. we ain't escaping out to this land. What you say? We ain't going nowhere. Come see we, me, because <laughs> we want all the smoke. Okay, all, <laughs> so, of it. all, all your of baby it. smoke. Yeah, all that little baby smoke. Right. We want all of it. Okay. Yes, the yeah. Donis is ready for it. Yes, but he yeah. is. He's definitely ready for it. <laughs> Interestingly <laughs> enough, so hopefully we'll be leaving uh, Miss Haley back in 2023. Okay, hopefully she won't be coming with us <laughs> 2024. Yeah. Go go out back to her to her resort that she lives on Kiowa Island, which of course is one of the Sea Islands of South Carolina. She lives out there on a on a resort, which must be beautiful because all the indigenous blood that was built on that island and all the Africans who were enslaved on that island. I hope she never gets another good night's sleep in her life because she's Mm. living literally in the middle of violence. But, you know, hopefully we won't have to deal with her or any of these other uh, fascist minded folk who are planning as we speak. You said they're planning? They're always planning. (laughs) Well, I mean, like literally the, the Heritage Foundation, of course, folks have been following that. They have developed a robust document Um, In addition to putting together resumes for a second Trump presidency so that they can very quickly staff the federal government with like minded folks, white nationalists, anti-immigrationists and all these. They've also developed a robust plan uh, for 2025 where they're talking about all the policies they want to implement. So when you see Donald Trump running around the country saying that if he is when he is reelected in his mind, he's going to set up camps, concentration camps basically, and deport anyone who doesn't have papers. And if you think that that's bad, uh, you can certainly imagine that a lot of people will be caught up in that who do have papers, in fact. Uh, Mm -hmm. The governor of Texas, of course, fully on board with Trump, sending these buses to New York. You saw Eric Adams. In droves. In droves. Eric Adams has sued. You saw uh, uh, in the news, everyone saw the mayor, the mayor of New York City sued the 17 bus companies that are transporting folk. Now, that Mm -hmm. case, that that might not work, but what he's doing is sending a message. If you are aiding and abetting these racists, then we're going to come after you. The governor of New Jersey has in, endorsed uh, that lawsuit because Phil Murphy in Jersey, right next door, now what they've started to do is take the buses to the Port Authority and over there in Jersey, and then they get on the train. and come. He's like, nah, y'all not getting ready to... So th- this really, what we're going to see in 2024, I think, mm-hmm. is the next step in the Cold Civil War. In other words, the states are fighting each other. Texas, Florida, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana is now fighting against the federal government. And they're going to really test whether or not the United States can continue as a federal entity. They're, they, they, they are off the chain in Texas. They passed yes. a law uh, in recent weeks where the, the state of Texas is now uh, deputized their law enforcement officials to arrest and deport immigrants coming across the Texas border, that is Mm. illegal. Mm. United States Constitution gives the authority to the federal government to deal with foreign policy and immigration, which the United States Constitution doesn't speak about, but it's in the the, the plenary powers of the federal government. It's illegal. That's been decided in the courts. But Texas is like, we know what was decided in the courts before 
we were able to pack the courts with these right wing judges. But now we're going to go back just like they went back with Dobbs to take away a woman's right to choose whether to terminate a pregnancy, just like they went back at the Voting Rights Act. They're going to go back on the question of immigration. 2024 could be buck wild. This could be the most significant year in the history of the United States Supreme Court since the 1850s. Mm, mm, Some mm. ways, in terms of pulling the country apart, we know for us the most significant uh, decade was the 1960s with voting rights and the voting rights. But the 1850s and 60s, Dred Scott and all that stuff, this court is lined up now. Uh, and the Chief Justice is probably very nervous right now because they're going to be called upon to rule on some cases that could literally define the next century if the United States lasts another century of the United States in terms of the law. That's insane. And again, you thought that, uh, well, we thought, right? Like we couldn't get no worse than taking away the woman's right to choose. And, and here we are. You're telling us that more stuff is, is going to be coming down the pike. That's right. Well, it's well, you know, in the wake of Dobbs, what they did in Florida, in fact, they just talked to a sister who was organizing folk. They've gotten, at this stage, they're nearing 900,000 votes to uh, uh, signatures to put on a ballot initiative in the state of Florida to restore a woman's right to choose in the Florida Constitution because in Florida, that fool legislature passed a 15-week ban before the Supreme Court overturned Roe, and then after, they passed a six-week ban. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, of course, and, and you, you you having had uh, our, our young brother and lovely young warrior Adonis know that, you know, better than, than most, and all women who have uh, given birth know this, you know, when does when did you know you were pregnant? If you if you don't know your body about six weeks, you might not even know. Listen, listen. The, I'm, I'm, that's funny that you say that because I tell the story of how I found that I was pregnant, and it's funny, right? Again, I'm not somebody who you know, old lady. I'm married, like so. Get pregnant, get pregnant. But mm -hmm. the way I found out was literally. I was trying to decide, like, am I pregnant or do I have COVID? I don't know, right? My, wait, wait, my, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> wait, you got, you got to let that, you got to let that breathe. That's like a cat. Wait, wait, I got to laugh. Am I pregnant or do I have COVID? <laughs> I'm telling you, okay, okay. I had just, I had just came from Las Vegas with my girlfriends. <laughs> we went to see Usher, so we were over there, we partying, right? When I was out there, my sinuses and all this was acting up. So, you know, you don't you don't know whether you got COVID or a cold these days. You have no clue what's going on. So I'm like, oh, it's crazy. So I get back home and my menstrual cycle is acting funny. Now, if you look at the studies on COVID, what they tell you is sometimes if you had it, it will jack up um, your cycle as a woman. Oh, interesting. I didn't know yeah. that. It'll set it off a month. It'll make it come early. It does all kinds of stuff to you. COVID does, right? So I'm like wow, my cycle is not on time. Like, is this COVID? So I didn't feel like sticking that up my nose and taking the COVID test, right? So I was like, let me take a pregnancy test. <laughs> if I'm pregnant, oh, that's what this is. Okay, that's bad. Yeah, okay. And I was like, then I might have COVID. I might have COVID. Child took a pregnancy test and boom, there it was. But like you said, wow. I didn't, I probably at that point was six, probably about six weeks, right? It might've been, wow. four, yeah. might've been four weeks, might've been mm. even sooner, D didn't know. As a woman, you, but if you cycle, hadn't taken the test and just tried to ride it out. Could have thought it was COVID and then would have went and could have been at 12 weeks at that point. How about that? And my and, period and shows up 12 weeks later and I'm like, oh, I'm not pregnant. Because even then, if I, you don't know. You just don't, you know. don't know. That's a great story. You, don't, you just don't know. That's a so great yes, story. absolutely. And if, if you're a woman and you, you don't always know. Uh, when mm. you're pregnant. And again, I was fortunate enough to miss a cycle to trigger me to say, oh, I might, you know, be pregnant. There are women who don't miss cycles, so I have no clue. I have no clue. And like you said, I mean, there are a lot of reasons that women may choose to terminate a pregnancy. Of course, Adonis is here, and we're grateful and, and, and wonderful. And you don't know, I mean, he's here, he's healthy, there were no problems. And that's a real blessing for sisters who aren't so fortunate. Uh, in Texas, they're saying, you know, we don't even want any exceptions but what if the baby has you know problems with and so but 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 to the to the underlying point this is what's going to be tested here in 2024 so who we need to leave in 2023 and not bring with us to 2024 is white men who think that they are able to have the right to choose for a woman How, that's right after having a baby 
That's right. I can full on understand no man in legislation no man. should be telling women of what any their color. rights are with the like not no women, period. Like you That's have right. no clue what women have to go through to Come bear on, children. Yeah. Like you Come just on. don't. And again, I wouldn't know unless I had the actual experience and the physical labor of having a child. No mm. man should be telling a woman what she can do with her body and with exactly. that baby. And then no disrespect to the men out there or the fathers out there. Even after you have the baby, mm. what you have to go through as a mother to like take care of that child, oh. right? The attachment that that child has to you, right? You're their lifeline. And again, yeah. no disrespect to the dads who do their thing, no. right? My husband is present, right? He's a no father. question. Good brother. No question. But if you ask him, who's that number one provider for this baby? It's me. Like Same. I'm yes. I'm that lifeline to that child. So again, imagine somebody telling me the right that I have to do with, with my child or with my body. And I'm the person who has to go through every last consequence yes, from that. Yes, no, so and we should leave the jokers. But then how do you get the right? It, that's when it goes into, it's all about control and it's all about power. That's absolutely right. It's all about power and control. And then, you know, you got all these conspiracy theories about, it's about population control in real life, right? Because it's really about making sure that white women aren't aborting white babies. But that's- and, 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 and this country, again, immigration has been the lifeblood of all societies, whether it's forced immigration, like we were forced here. And, or immigration like we're seeing now. And what you see is that the birth rates in this country have actually declined across groups, black, brown, white. However, the numbers of non-white children uh, continue to increase as a percentage of the population. But there is that fear. That is what stokes things like this great replacement theory that, you know, some of these white nationalists are around, running around, even like the uh, Congresswoman Stefanik, who went after Claudine Gay and the presidents of the University of Pennsylvania and, and MIT uh, famously late last year, you know, extolling this idea that somehow these people are going to, quote unquote, replace us. And you're right. I mean, no man of any background, and unfortunately there are too many non-white men who are running out here repeating that because they, they done misread the Bible or the Quran or perhaps read it read in their mind correctly and say, no, we're going to control women's bodies. No, you're not going to do that. But all of it is driven by fear, various fears. And, and we should leave that in 2023, too, if we could. And if we can't, we're going to fight it in 24 for sure. Yeah. So how do we keep um, our young people connected um, to what's happening in the world and prepare them, really, um, to how to advocate and fight for and fight against like all of these things that are happening? Um, and But how do you keep education in, in schools at the center of that? Well, you know, I think we're facing things that our elders and ancestors didn't have to face. The technology, the march of technology is relentless. We know that 2023 saw another quantum leap in artificial intelligence. We saw what happened at OpenAI with Sam Altman, the CEO, after in the wake of a discovery their scientists made, they had uh, a computer that solved a math problem uh, based on data that was put in its system, but also made a leap taking into account some data that hadn't been put into the system the way I read the story. And that triggered alarms. The people at the company, there was a split. People say, wait a minute, hold on. We need to research this because I think they call it open general AI. In other words, general intelligence. This, if this machine is thinking beyond what we've programmed it to do, then it might turn around and decide we're the problem. Now we got a real life matrix. <laughs> and, then, and then there were other people that said, well, no, but we need to maximize profits. And it caused a real struggle in the company because there are those who said, we just need to make as much money as we can and get ahead of this and own this technology. And there were others that said, slow down. What are the consequences of that? At the end of the day, the people who want to make the money, they won out and they restored the CEO and got rid of the board and all this kind of thing. But what does that have to do with education and our young people? Well, you know, our young people now who are being born digital, I mean, Adonis is born into a world where he won't know what analog is, what reading books without computers is. Uh, you know, he, he'll, he'll grow up in a society by the time he gets to be uh, school age, they'll probably have, they won't have Google Glass, they'll probably have contact lenses where you can, somebody can be looking you dead in your face and they're just looking at a screen. They can have virtual reality. And, and how do we help these young people navigate that? 
Well, we're in a podcast. Everybody got a podcast now. Everybody has it. So so rather than shrink from it, we're going to have to lean into it. But at a time when there is so much out there, so much stimuli, so much information, you know, the time for developing quality is, you know, is something we have to be take very seriously. I mean, so when you bring people into this space, they have to know their stuff. They have to be very clear and, and concise. And over the weeks as and months as this space continues into 2024, people need to be able to rely on it. You know, what are the books that my young person should be reading? What are the experiences? What are the museums? What, what is the curriculum? What are the thinking questions that they should be developing? What are the websites they can trust and which ones can't they trust? Because everything is up for grabs now. and Finally, everything's being disrupted. When I met uh, Mashariki Jawanza, our new ancestor who made transition on the day of Imani, faith, the first uh, day of the year here, to, uh, January 1st, it was 30 years ago. It's 1993. And we had been doing a radio show in Columbus called Free Your Mind. Every Saturday morning for an hour, we'd be on there talking about history and it would record the cassette record the show on cassette tapes and we had a machine that could duplicate the tapes and we would sell the tapes to get more money to buy another week of airtime. And <laughs> so we did some of our tapes got around the country and one of the places they got were in was Indianapolis and an elder, Charles Hankerson, who became an ancestor, oh maybe almost 30 years ago, he got the tapes and he was playing them and Mashariki, who at that time was working for the Indianapolis Public Schools, she was the assistant director of the Office of African American and Multicultural Affairs for IPS, Indianapolis Public Schools. She heard the tapes and said, oh, we should bring these young people to our conference. At that time, educators were having these infusion conferences around the country, these multicultural conferences, Atlanta, New York, Oakland, Seattle, all over the country. And Indianapolis was having them. And so at that time, of course, this is before computers really hit. And all this internet stuff was there. There's no YouTube, there's no Facebook, this kind of thing. So you had to come to conferences to hear people, to change, you know, exchange curriculum ideas. And so I saw that as a preface to this. We went out there and we did a series of workshops on curriculum. That's where I met Holly Garima because Sankofa had just come out. Mashariki and I brought him out there to show the film Sankofa. Tony Browder, Marimba Ani, we were all out there. And so I watched this sister whose offices were at the famous Christmas Attics High School in Indianapolis. Mashriki's offices were there, which was an all-Black school during segregation, elite quality education, elite quality athletics. That's where Oscar Robinson, the great basketball player, went to, uh, went to Christmas Attics. I watched her over the years move from analog spaces where you're doing teaching and learning. Uh, that, 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 that summer, she brought Tupac, of all people, she and some other people, that's why the one time I met Tupac, they brought Tupac out. Juice had just come out to the Indiana Black Expo to talk to young people. And, and if you ever watch, I think there's one of those Tupac documentaries they did on him. There's a clip in there where he's going off. He said, I don't care what you call yourself, African, African-American. Oh, he, said, he said, we out here fighting over the, that was the conference. Mashariki and them brought him out with all these old hits. She, she went from that to the digital age and she never abandoned her principles, but the, the delivery system changed. So now we were online during COVID. We continued to have those conferences, continued to have those meetings. And what we had to do for our young people is connect them to that long arc of movement building that are represented by the Maisha and Ngozas, by the Mashariki Jawanzas, by that sisterhood and brotherhood and bring it into today. And that's what you've been doing. That's why the archive of what you didn't do doing the podcast is so important because you brought these elders into this space and made them accessible to the next generation. And we yes. have to keep doing that. Yes, that's super important. Uh, you can't lose touch with your history. No. Um, you can't lose touch with the people who are building the foundations and making those connections and carrying on tradition. Like that's, that's right. super important. Yes. Um, so I love how you said that um, and how you outlined Mama Jariki's kind of evolution and development. She never lost her principles. She adapted with the times, right? But she yes. never lost her principles. But I think that's important for educators who are listening to our podcast to hear and understand that because the world changes so quickly. Technology oh. is changing everything so quickly. Um, but we got to keep our young people in tune with what's happening. Um, and we have to speak their language for sure. Yes. For sure. So 
So we know what's coming up, um, as always, Martin Luther King Day. So I definitely want us to be able to talk about Martin Luther King because around this time, we know that they whitewash um, that brother. Um, it's let's all hold hands across America and be one yeah. <laughs> every time it's Martin Luther King Day. <laughs> but I want to make sure in this space, on this podcast, we continue to lift that brother up and talk about who the real um, MLK was mm. and what he was really about. Mm-hmm. So if you could leave our views with anything, any impression of that brother, Martin Luther King, uh, of course. What, what, what would it be? You know, I think if I had to say in a sentence something that everyone should be remember should remember about Dr. King, it would be Dr. King, Martin Luther King is a sterling example of the power of black institutions to transform everyone's lives. Dr. King was raised in a black family, born there at 501. Auburn Avenue in, in Atlanta. Those of you who know Atlanta, you know Auburn Avenue, Ebenezer Baptist Church, right down the street from where his daddy was the pastor, where his grandfather was the pastor, his mother's father, that is, Alberta, Miss Alberta Williams. Her father, A.D. Williams, was the pastor. That's where Senator Raphael Warnock is the pastor now, Senator Warnock. All that's right there in Auburn Avenue. You're talking about basically three, four blocks. The King Center is there if you ever get a chance to go there. In fact, we did a one uh, Wednesday Freedom Summer book talk in our work. I was there at the King Center. So I just brought my computer down and opened up and sitting right there across from where Martin and Coretta King are buried, their crib, right there on literally on the grounds of Ebenezer Baptist Church. I said, well, since we down here talking about SNCC and the SNCC office and we stayed on Freedom, let's do it from the King Center right down the street from the SNCC office. So by the way, you can see. But um, the Black family, the Black church, and then he grew up in the black schools, the segregated schools of Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, you know, his family, his people. Then he went to Morehouse College in 1944. He's born in 1929. Well, he was 15 years old. Yeah, because they lowered the admission age at Morehouse to keep some of these young boys as teenagers out of World War II. That was the vision of the great man they called Buck Benny, the great Benjamin Elijah Mays, who was one of the great uh, Jegnas, one of the great leaders and teachers of Martin King. And so he went to Morehouse. His sister, Christine, was next door at Spelman. So HBCUs, again, (laughs) this is very important. Uh, Right on Auburn Avenue, the Atlanta Daily World, the newspaper, the black newspaper, the Prince Hall Masons, the Order of the Eastern Star, all it was there, Big Bethel AME Church. This was a black, black community. There's a great book called Where, Where Peachtree Meets Sweet Auburn. Peachtree was the, was the street still in Atlanta, which represented kind of like white wealth, Coca-Cola, the Chandlers and all that. And then that there's an intersection there comes into Auburn Avenue. That was the black center in so many ways. So by the time that the king graduates with a degree in sociology uh, in June 1948, he then goes off to Crozier Theological Seminary. Where is Crozier? Well, that's right down the street from where you are, Chester, Pennsylvania. Now, that's not a black school, but he kept coming to Philly because that's where the black churches were. He was going to, so Dr. King is nurtured by the Philadelphia community. A lot of people don't know. He was, he, black Philly touched Martin King when he was in graduate school. He finished studying there. And then 1951, he went to Boston University, which is where he met his wife, Coretta Scott. Coretta Scott is from Alabama, Marion, Alabama. She came out of there. She was a trained singer in the kind of European style. She went to Oberlin. Uh, then eventually uh, there in, 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 in Boston, she's at the conservatory. They met. He started dating her. They got married in 1953. And then he came to another black church, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He and his wife moved to Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy, the first place they played Dixie in public. If you go to the Alabama State House right now, and I was down there in September, no, October, and uh, we went over. You see the state house. You see a statue of Jefferson Davis still on that state house grounds. You come down literally one block, and that's where Dexter Avenue Baptist Church was. That black church in Montgomery, Alabama, where Coretta King and her husband took up residence. That's where their first baby was born, Yolanda Denise, in 1955 in November. Uh, and then about two weeks after that, after Yolanda is born, that's when Rosa McCauley Parks, born in Tuskegee, Alabama, said, I'm not getting up out this chair. 
on this bus. <laughs> and the Montgomery bus boycott start another black institution, Joanne Robinson and the Women's Political Council. Joanne Robinson was an English teacher at Alabama State University. Those sisters made a flyer and ran off thousands of copies over the weekend and started the boycott on the Monday after Miss Parse was arrested. And by the 5th of December, after the work of these black women, they had a meeting at another black church, Hope Street Baptist Church, and they formed something called the Montgomery Improvement Association and put Dr. Mm -hmm. King, 26 years old, at ch in charge. Now, I'm going to stop there with one other thing. From that moment, these are all black institutions. For all black institutions. From 1956 until he was assassinated in 1968, that's a, that's a tiny amount of time. Mm -hmm. Dr. King, 26 years old when he was made the, the president of the Montgomery Pro Improvement Association and 39 years old when he was assassinated. And when you think about that, that little space of time, 13 years, transformed the United States, transformed the world, and people will give that credit to Mahatma Gandhi, the United States Constitution. They talk about, I have a dream, but we ain't talked about none of that. <laughs> We're talking about Benjamin Mays and Joanne Robinson and, and E.D. Nixon and all these people. These are black people, black women and black men. And that's what I think everybody needs to understand about Martin King. He was created out of black institutions, beginning with the black family. Mm, mm -mm. Created out of black institutions, connected by black institutions, all of that. I love that. Yeah. I love that. That's And that's big, Dr. Carr. And the reason why that's so big and that's so important, because again, if you reflect now, right, we're looking at at 2024, you have to ask yourself, where and what are the Black institutions? Mm. Because so much of what you were talking about and so much of what you're saying, Dr. King was heavily connected to the Black church. Um, and the Black church was it was a sacred space. Absolutely. That's how you were able to plot and plan and co-conspire, right? Because it was a sacred space. Like, of course, you went to worship every Sunday, but you knew that the neighborhood was going to be there. The pastor could give a message in the pulpit. Uh, you could have Sunday school, give a message at Sunday school. You could organize, you can speak. It was a sacred place. Um, same thing when you talk about the black family uh, being a black institution, right? So hmm. being grounded in certain morals, certain values of certain conversations you have with your kids in your household, uh, certain, certain ways of being, doing and knowing all of that uh, Martin Luther King was connected to. But then you have to ask yourself, right? At this point, right? Because back then it was um, segregation. There was still a certain level of whiteness that has not that had not infiltrated even the black household. Ooh, Lord. Um, so even though you have institution, right? And you still have black family now, but how much of that space has been infiltrated um, by whiteness or infiltrated by things outside of your home that you can't necessarily control that your children are exposed to or influenced by? Uh, to a certain degree, right? But during segregation, you didn't have that. No. So as you talk about the life um, of Martin Luther King and what made him the man that he is, I can't help but think, what are the Black institutions of today? Um, what are influencing our Black people and our Black leaders of today? This is one of them. It looks very different. Martin King didn't have a, a Black educator pipeline uh, he didn't have a, a, a podcast. He didn't have the internet. He didn't have. Imagine you imagine he had a podcast called Let Freedom Ring. Sorry, Let I didn't. Say that. <laughs> but the, the, look, you look seriously. Th this is the value of this space because whether we want to or not, that is the imagination we have to cultivate with our young people because they're gonna they're gonna be on this space. So they need to come on with that question. Can you yeah. imagine? Yes, I can. And this is what he would have said. That's now the trade off is there, as you say, because there wasn't there. And because, you know, Jim and Jane Crow, uh, U.S. apartheid had separated us out. He didn't have that concern. So that there were there was black curriculum in the black schools. So there was Black History Month was not an anomaly in these segregated schools in Atlanta, in, in Memphis, in, 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 in Montgomery. They, they were not. You got that. In fact, a, a very poignant story, because there are a couple of these elders who are still around. One of them, of course, is the great Fred Gray. I had a chance to meet Fred Gray. Fred Gray was a, uh, is an attorney. Still to this day, he's in his 90s. He's practicing law. He was King and, and Rosa Parks, and Edie Nixon, and the Montgomery Proof Association. He was their attorney. He filed the case that became Browder versus Gale, which was one was uh, decided in November 1956 that 
where the Supreme Court affirmed the lower courts and said that the segregated buses in Montgomery violated the 14th Amendment. Fast forward to 2024. This Supreme Court is going to be forced to decide whether or not Donald Trump violated Section 3 of that same 14th Amendment by calling for an insurrection. And if they do not say that he violated it, the question is going to be, are, is your cowardice going to take the place of interpreting a very clean, plain language reading of the 14th Amendment? Now, I suspect Katanji Brown Jackson is not going to go for it. Now, them other eight, I can't speak for them. But in 1956, they got it right. Their lawyer, Fred Gray, one of the clients that he represented in Browder versus Gale was a young sister named Claudette Colvin, who was also still alive, lives in New York. Claudette Colvin was the teenager, of course, who they had arrested and thrown off the buses before Rosa Parks. They used to attack black women, black teenagers. They shot and killed a black veteran on the buses. They, they, were, they were warring against these black people in Montgomery. Claudette Colvin tells a very powerful story. It speaks to exactly what you're raising in terms of these black schools. She said, I had just come from school that day. And we had done these lessons on black history. And she named her teacher. She talked about Black History Month. They had killed one of her classmates. Young brother had been killed. And they were still mourning that. She's mm -hmm. on the bus. And she said, when they tried to throw me off the bus that day, I just grabbed the seat and sat there. And then they started pulling at me, these police pulling me. And she said, I started crying. I started saying the Lord's Prayer. And, you, and then she says, but I had just done this Black History lesson. So I felt like Harriet Tubman was sitting on one shoulder mm -hmm. and Sojourner Truth was on the other shoulder. Sojourner. And they was holding me down. I couldn't get up. And so they, they literally had to throw. But she ends up being one of the plaintiffs in Browder versus Gale. People don't understand. Your ability to not live in a segregated society was purchased by black teenagers, too, who were in black schools. In 2024, the question becomes, what is the lesson that we can infuse in our young people using this new technology, using this new world so they can come out fortified like a Claudette Cole? So they can come out fortified like a Martin King coming out of Morehouse or his sister, Christine, coming out of Spelman. Or if they don't get a chance to go to college. The technology we have now, which is why we have this space, which is why we do in class with car, why we do the black table. It, it doesn't matter whether you went to college or not to get the information, because now the technology makes it so it can come in your house. Yes, it, we, sh we have to imagine if Martin Luther King had a podcast, Let Freedom Ring. This might be what it looks like, what it would have looked like. <laughs> yes. Speaking of that, this is an interesting question because I know we come up on time and I really wanted to ask you this. So let's say Martin Luther King did have a podcast called Let Freedom Ring, right? What do you think he would say right now about the struggle between Palestine and Israel? What do you think would be Brother Martin's stance? That's easy. The reason it's easy because he talked about that. You know, Martin Luther King visited the camps. As we know, we, we know we've talked about that. Martin, he wasn't alone. Muhammad Ali went over there. Malcolm actually went to that region. Of course, when Martin King visits... It's still not very much worked out as to what that's going to be. And Martin King talked about the solidarity that we have to express with all oppressed peoples. And that includes people who have been displaced through no fault of their own. And it includes us understanding that John Henry Clark used to always say this. Of course, Dr. Clark was born January 1st, 1915 in nearby Union Springs, Alabama. Dr. Dr. Clark used to say in some stories, there aren't any good guys. So. When we look at the people who were literally dumped in that region of the world, coming out of Europe, the people who we would call the Jews much too broadly, but folks who became those who were settled there by the British with support from the Americans and others after World War II, those people have been set upon and persecuted by the Nazis in the European, in the Nazi Holocaust. And so this racism they were escaping was something that the world had to support them being relieved of. But the solution wasn't to displace people who had nothing to do with that. The Palestinians and the Arabs in that region are displaced. And so Dr. King, when visiting, said, two wrongs don't make a right. This has to be made right. People can live in peace, but you can't disrespect people's common humanity. So if he were here today, I think he would echo what he said. There's an excellent book called Black Power and Palestine which chronicles all of these black folk from around the world who visited that region, who had these connections, the Black Panthers, the Pan-African Movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, Ethel Minor, who made transition last year, uh, was the editor of the SNCC newsletter when they came out against 
the violence in Palestine. We talked about it in State on Freedom, the conversation we were having with Mama Zahara and Baba Mike involved in very much in that critique. So we don't have to guess at what Martin Luther King would say. Martin Luther King would say he would stand on the side of our common humanity as he did. And he would say that we have to stop. Certainly the first thing we have to do is stop this killing. There is no justification for slaughter. And that's what's going on right now in that region. Nobody can defend it from any side politically. And no one should be persecuted for speaking out against it. Dr. King certainly wouldn't have shrunk from that. From that. Shout out to Dr. King from the grave. Let freedom ring, okay? Let freedom ring. Let freedom ring. <laughs> it's funny. I just think I'm like, that's that would be the name of that brother's podcast. No Let freedom right. ring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. For sure. But no, I think that um, it's important to put into perspective because I think people, again, tend to very much forget who Dr. King was. They just do. Absolutely. No clue. Or they never knew. Or they've been or it's been very carefully curated so that people are encouraged to think about I have a dream, only part of the speech. And that's it. And he got shot. But this is what I'm about to say. Two things. (laughs) But it's true. We didn't get to the 60s. We still in the 50s talking about him, right? (laughs) We didn't even get to that part, right? Because we are talking about the essence of who Dr. King really is. But can you just talk about the speech real quick? Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, you know, but of course, you know, we fast forward from from the Montgomery bus boycott. And that's, of course, when it takes off. You know, after that boycott is over, uh, they formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957. Uh, he actually spoke at the Washington, uh, at the Lincoln Memorial in 1957 at a prayer breakfast and, and, and previewed some of this stuff. He published his stride toward freedom. He's traveling around. He finally goes to India in 1959 and meets Jamal Nehru. See, it was it wasn't Dr. King who met Gandhi. It was uh, Mordecai Johnson and Benjamin Mays and all them. It wasn't even him. They told him he's reading it. Um, he moves to Atlanta in 1960. That's the year that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was founded. Um, and the students jump in the movement. By 61, uh, you see the Freedom Rides take place. John Lewis and them come into to, to view and all that's going on. He's arrested in Albany in 1962. You see this movement building. And by 1963, it is time. That's April. Remember, April of 1963, March and April. That's when the Children's Confrontation, what uh, Y.T. Walker who was SCLC leader called Confrontation, Operation C for Confrontation. That's when the children go to Birmingham, in Birmingham, and they fight back. That's where you see the fire hoses. The fire hoses and the uh, dogs. Bull Connor. With Bull Connor, yes. Exactly. So they decide they're going to march to Washington. They're going to be poor people, black people, all people wanting freedom, stand up to make sure the Constitution is supposed to, it says and does what it means. All of that work. They then reach out to a brother who's been involved in this since the 30s and 40s, Bayard Rustin, who is from nearby Chester, Pennsylvania. He and the man that he has worked closely with for decades at this point, the great A. Philip Randolph, they said they were calling for Randolph was calling for a march on Washington in the 40s. Shout out to Anna Arnold Hedgeman from uh, who lived most of her life in Minnesota. Powerful sister who was involved in this as a great organizer. Anyway, they then put together a march on Washington. And of course, that is the march where the government, business interests, other people decide we can't stop it. And in in Malcolm X's very poignant critique, since they couldn't stop it, they said, we're going to join it. And they try to tone it down. Y'all can't spend the night. We got got to approve all the signs. We got to make sure Bayard Rustin makes sure it comes off. The trade off is we got to vet all the speeches. This is when the, the very controversial moment when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee speech is revised in part because the Catholic Church threatens to pull out if they go too hard in the paint or in the blast stuff. <laughs> All this stuff, Julian Bond tells that story, John Lewis didn't tell that story. And so Dr. King is given the last speech of that day. There's a debate over women. And Arnold Hedgeman is like, where the sisters at? Daisy Bates and them is like, where the sisters at? Polly Murray and them, where, where the sisters at? And so they... Uh, Daisy Bates speaks. Um, what's the sister? Um, uh, Josephine Baker speaks. A lot of people don't know. They were women who spoke. They should have been centered, but we don't see that and people don't put it out there. There's footage. You hear them talk. Josephine Baker flew in from France where she is. I'm leaving this country. And so she came in. Anyway, that the king gets the last speech. His I have a dream speech, which he had given almost the exact same speech in Detroit. It was recorded and, and, and sold as a record in Detroit on a little off label 
of a company that was coming into its own in Detroit called Motown. Motown. <laughs> right. So Barry Gordy had record had had made recording of the speech. Actually, the brothers who did it, Milton Henry and and uh, well, they knew they were known as uh, Gaidi and Amari Obadelli, who started Republican New Africa. These are friends of Mashariki Juwanza, by the way, who was coming of age at this time in the sixties. Dr. King's speech, he had given that speech before. But at the end of that speech, where he starts by saying, we've come to the nation's capital with a check. This check has been returned insufficient funds. It's a reparation speech. Mashriga was a leader in the reparations movement. She always made this point. Said, Dr. King is coming saying, y'all have declared that y'all bankrupt, but I don't believe that. And after he finishes the speech, he's right at the end and the let freedom ring part that you are quoting was because behind him, Clarence Jones tells this story. He who helped him write the speech. He's still alive. He just published his memoir, Dr. King's lawyer. He said, Mahalia Jackson, who Dr. King loved to hear, is up there behind him and says, Tell him about the dream. <laughs> Martin Luther King. Because <laughs> Mahalia Jackson's like Martin Luther King. See, these are church people. So he she know you ain't you ain't sold it yet, Martin. Hold up. We in the we in the pulpit. These people, they love the speech, but you need to bring this home. Say, tell about the dream. And Martin Luther King, without looking back, I have a dream. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. You done brought the whole world to church. It, it, is a, it is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. And other next because Mahalia. Hey, it's like, bruh, the speech on paper is good, but now you need to go into that black preacher bag, son. You need so the black woman is like, bruh, you gotta come in the bag. But how you gonna put the battery of Martin Luther King put back? The bat- just like you do every day, you are Adonis. The black woman cannot be discounted at the center. You gotta put the battery in the bag. Because back, the- we got because we got your bag. Okay. You got your bag, son. We got your bag. Eyes. And so he gives that speech. And of course, the response to that speech is not August 28th when he gives that speech, but three weeks later in September on the 18th, on a Sunday in Birmingham, when you see Addie Mae Collins and Carol Denise McNair and Cynthia Diane Wesley and Carol Robeson murdered in the 16th Street Baptist Church by the Klan blowing up that corner of the church. And later that day, Johnny Robinson and Virgil Ware, two black boys killed in the streets of Birmingham, one by a punk cop who shot Johnny Robinson in the back and Virgil Ware, who was murdered by these young white boys shooting off guns and died in his brother's arms when they were delivering the Birmingham Sunday paper. Those six children, those Birmingham six, in many ways, that's the response to the March on Washington. People don't talk about, even when they talk about those killings, they mention the four girls, but they were boys too. These children were killed. And Dr. King lives five more years. And of course, he publishes Why We Can't Wait, he, you see the Black Power generation emerge, so the Carmichael and him, he, he's going to give him the Nobel Prize the following year. Um, and then you see Dr. King move toward this radical critique of American society. In his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos the Community, he's saying everything has to change. The government has to step in. We need a fundamental universal basic income. We need jobs and housing and employment. We need health care. He's writing about all that. He says, and for you white liberals to think y'all helping somebody because y'all say we're not discriminating. He said, no, sometimes you're the most dangerous Why? <laughs> because you're not going where you need to go. And of course, in 1957, he comes out against the Vietnam War. So we don't have to guess what Dr. King would have said about Iraq or Afghanistan, or what he would say about the Ukraine, or what do you say about Palestine? No, I'm against war. And when he came out against the Vietnam War in 1967, he lost a great deal of support from white liberals, from scared Negroes. They backed up away from him. And he says, we're going to come to D.C. again with the Poor People's Campaign. But of course, on his way to organizing that in 1968, on the 28th of March, he was called to Memphis to give uh, some speech and to help the, the sanitation workers who were striking there because they were paying those brothers unfairly. In fact, a brother just made transition in January who was, I think he was 92. He was one of the brothers who at 36 years old joined that March in 1968. This man retired in night in 2017. This brother who was just, uh, just here with us. He was in his 80s. He was still working in the sanitation department. What the hell? <laughs> it's great. And of course, that detour on the way there, 28th of March, he uh, he participated in the March 1968, the 3rd of April. He gave his final speech at Mason Temple, M- Mason Temple in Memphis. I've been to the mountaintop. He said, I mean, I get there with you. And of course, the next day he was murdered at the Lorraine Motel 
in Memphis. And, and that's the story of Martin King. But that speech in 1963, people try to freeze him on them steps with a few words at the end. And that just completely misrepresents the life and work of Martin King. Absolutely does. Thank you, brother, for going yeah. into that. No, of course. Um, and it's good, right? Because over the next couple of weeks, yes. you're going to hear a snippets from I Have a Dream and that my children will be judged by the content of their, their skin, but the character, like those are the, the little pieces of the speech, right? That that people are going to pull out, but it's very, and, and very the, important to know who Martin Luther King was. Absolutely. And the thing that bothers me the most about that holiday is Dr. King called for public resources to be used to support all the people in a society. Mm -hmm. And on Martin Luther King's birthday, they're going to have people painting walls at schools, picking up trash in the neighborhood. They're going to have people serving food. They're going to, instead of, didn't we just have a school budget? Who's supposed to paint these walls? Wait a minute, we're picking up trash in the neighborhood. How much money did you uh, allocate to the, uh, to the Santa? In other words, on Martin Luther King's birthday, they're going to have people go out doing service that the government is supposed to pay for on the very day. I'm like, y'all, I ain't painting nothing on Martin Luther King's birthday. We're going to go out to the playground. And I ain't painting nothing. Dr. King would be like, didn't we pay for new equipment? What are y'all? Y'all done trick black people on Martin Luther King. Y'all better be out here painting these walls at these schools. <laughs> that makes me so mad. Like, <laughs> they have named it a Martin Luther King Day of Service. That is what the name of the a day is. A day of service. Instead of saying, well, these billionaires Y'all got all this money. Where's my money? <laughs> I mean, I, I tell you though, I go, I give him credit though. It's a hell of a trick. <laughs> a hell of a trick. Now the King birthday, you shouldn't be doing nothing. I'm like, no, I ain't doing nothing on Martin Luther King birthday, but talking about Martin Luther King. Happy birthday, Dr. King. This is what I'm saying. So don't call me to come nowhere and paint nothing on Martin Luther King Day of Service. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not. You're right. It's supposed to be our day off. It's our it's day. Supposed be, supposed to be our day. People are supposed to be in service to us. You know, see, we, we had to come back. To, I must say this, though, Shannon. This is very interesting. Because Dr. King was assassinated in April. The following mm -hmm. year, that was the first year that Dr. King's birthday was celebrated as a holiday by many people who knew him. Long before Stevie Wonder joined with Caress Scott King and wrote that happy birthday song and put it on Hotter Than July and went around the country with uh, Gil Scott Heron. He, Gil Scott Heron writes about this in his book, The Last Holiday. And long before the big Martin Luther King rallies, black people started taking Dr. King's birthday off in 1969. 70, 71. Like, where's y'all? Charles ain't coming to work. It's Daddy King's birthday. I mean, it wasn't no official birthday. <laughs> like, and so when people think, oh, Ronald Reagan signed the law, no, Negroes had started taking Dr. King's birthday off the year after he was killed. And so it's always important to understand that we didn't wait on the government. No, this is our man. We taking his birthday off. <laughs> I remember being a little girl and people talking about on the 15th, don't go to school. And I remember telling my mom, like, no. <laughs> People are saying they shouldn't go to school because it's Martin Luther King's birthday. <laughs> I remember that. I so distinctly remember that. That's so beautiful. So you're absolutely right. People were saying we are taking this day. Whether they sign it into law or not, we are taking this day. As Nina Simone said, you know, the king of love is dead. You know, I loved him. This would in fact, after he was assassinated, she went to the funeral in Atlanta. She recorded something. If y'all get a chance, go listen to her live performance of uh, Sundays in Savannah. Mississippi G. Dam, and then she did The King of Love is Dead. Those three songs together are called the Martin Luther King Suite. She rewrote some of the words, and then when she played Mississippi G. Dam, she's playing the end, and she and then in, in the break, she says, you know, I loved him. I loved him because he believed it. And then she said, the King of Love is dead. I ain't about to be nonviolent, honey. And then she starts laughing and it comes back in the thing. In other words, the reason we're taking the day off because he believed it. He was nonviolent. We not nonviolent. Y'all took him. Y'all better be glad I ain't come to work today because I might mess around and y'all might catch these hands. Dr. King, y'all murdered Dr. King. Who is y'all? All of y'all. It wasn't just James Earl Ray. It wasn't just the FBI. It was this country. This man never raised a hand to nobody and you took his life and then in the wake of it, you're going to try to make him into some punk. No. As his friend uh, Vincent Harding, who, who came and spoke to our Freedom School, who is now an ancestor, Vincent Harding, his friend, who helped him write the Why I Opposed the War in Vietnam speech, Vincent Harding called him the inconvenient hero. 
Absolutely. Now, the king is an inconvenient Absolutely. hero. Because y'all to make him a hero, y'all gotta neuter him. Because he's very inconvenient if you just tell the truth about him. You can't tell the truth. You can't tell the truth. Can't tell the truth, can't acknowledge what's really going on. No, you can't. Can't. You can't. For I know sure. we're in law, but I mean this is so it's so you, you know, you're raising it's just you're raising the, the right questions. This is important. Well, you know, I was I was going for a minute, but I'm back. So no we, had, we had we had a You was handling for the business. <laughs> <laughs> we had a we had a lot to discuss. And we were squeezing a lot into this episode. But Doc, I as always want to thank you for coming back and joining the welcome back episode. Um, and thank you for the gems and the knowledge that you always bestow upon us um and drop on us. Uh, but so much more we'll be talking about um in the coming months because uh because we back we back we back never left never left we just uh resuming this part of the work because you never stop working we love you we glad baby adonis is here we surrounding y'all with love and uh looking forward to this coming year to the next freedom summer all of our work all of our work yes may this year be our best year i share Yes. So shout out to all my co-conspirators. Thank you for coming back and listening to our Welcome Back episode. Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast is hosted by the Center for Black Educated Development with the help of our partners at Brightbeam. So please subscribe to your, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, like and share. Uh, but we'll love you. We'll see you here next time. Peace, everybody. <laughs>